are listening to Northwest Brew Talk. Now here's your host, Mike Rizzo. Welcome to Northwest Brew Talk. I'm Mike Rizzo, and this is episode number two. On today's show, we have an interview with Triceratops Brewing of Olympia and owner Rob Horn. We'll have some brew news and views, and to start the show, let's open an Elysian Men's Room Red. That's right, we're going to talk about Elysian Brewing today, so we're going to open up the Men's Room Red. The Men's Room Red is a 5.6% alcohol by volume, and it is a original red ale in amber color with a light hop aroma and toasty malt finish. Also won a silver medal in 2012 Great American Beer Festival for an ordinary bitter category. So let's pour some Men's Room Red here. And this uh, goes along with KISW, uh, the Men's Room Show, and uh, proceeds from this go to the Fisher House. So we're going to talk about a lesion on the news. So why don't we kick off the news after we have a sip of our Men's Room Red. Well, the big news late last week was the announcement that Seattle-based Elysian Brewing Company was being purchased by none other than Anheuser-Busch. That sent tidal waves throughout the brewing community and in Washington even more so. Further, uh, for their part, I should say, the Elysian owners said nothing would change. They were all staying on, but according to Dick Cantwell, co-founder and head brewer, quote, by joining with Anheuser-Busch, we'll be able to take the next steps to bring that energy and commitment to a larger audience, unquote. In a more recent um, interview, I saw that Dick Cantwell said that uh, this was not his choice and he was uh, outnumbered by the other members of his board. So uh, this decision was not necessarily his, but it's one that they're going to move forward with. Now, a lesion was started nearly 20 years ago and brewed 50,000 barrels in 2014, making it Washington's largest brewery and definitely ripe for the picking. Now, according to BendBulletin.com, Bend Oregon-based 10-barrel brewing was sold to Anheuser-Busch in November 14th, and at a public meeting on January 22nd, the owner said that Anheuser-Busch is spending $10 million to expand their brewery and adding six new 400-barrel tanks. Uh, They make no apologies for selling to Anheuser-Busch. Now, as a former small business owner, I see both sides of this debate. I've read comments from the haters and those wishing Elysian well. Some people say their beer was never that good anyhow, and now they have reason to switch. At one point, I tried to partner with several different companies when I owned a a delivery company. It was complicated, and in the end, I just sold the business outright to another company that wasn't a competitor. Now, he ran it into the ground, but that's not the point. If the owners of 10 Barrel wanted to expand but didn't want the huge loans, or if the Elysian owners saw dollars away before them, I can get that. If you liked their beer before, why stop drinking it? Because the profits go to a corporate behemoth? Well, how about think about this? What about the iPhone that you have that's manufactured in China? Or what about the vehicle you drive that maybe is made down south? Now, those paychecks of the workers, they stay in their communities. But again, the profits end up overseas. So how is that any different? If you didn't drink Elysian before, don't worry about it. If you did only because they were local, then find another microbrewery to support. But if you drank it, like the Men's Room Red I'm drinking right now, and you just like the beer, then just drink it and shut up. On the other end of this story, we have uh, a different perspective here. We've got Ninkasi Brewing out of uh, Eugene, Oregon. They announced on January 15th that they were partnering with Bigfoot Beverage Distributors in Downstate Oregon and the Odom Corporation in Western Washington and leaving their distributor that was owned by Anheuser-Busch after the merger of uh, a couple uh, private distributors. So you've got the other end of the spectrum there. So again, that's the Elysian uh, situation. Big deal here in Washington. But that is our uh, news and views for this week 
And uh, right after a quick break, we're going to be back with Rob Horn of Triceratops Brewing. Welcome back to Northwest Brew Talk. If you have not yet subscribed to our podcast, why not do it now? It's free, available on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and other fine sites. And if you like us, a review or a rating would greatly be appreciated. Now, we're going to talk to Rob Horn. He is the founder of Triceratops Brewing out of Olympia, Washington. How are you doing today, Rob? Uh, Not too bad. Good. How about yourself? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, First of all, why don't we start out, where did the name come from? Okay, um, well... Like you said, my last name is Horn, and um, I have three children. So I felt a Triceratops would probably be the best way to go oh. um, with, uh, with a name. And um, I started the brewing company. Um, my kids go to the Waldorf School in Olympia, and my wife and I were kind of struggling with tuition. So I felt that this would be a good way for me to supplement income So uh, for that. So in turn, I really try to make this as bad as much as I can about my kids. So I've got, you know, they're out here helping me. I have a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old, and they're all pretty involved. Uh, I mean, as much as they can be, obviously. Sure. But, yeah. Okay. That's a very cool, that's a very cool reason. Um, so uh, were you a home brewer? How did you get involved in, in brewing? Um, well, I started home brewing. Uh, my wife and I moved out here from New Jersey um, in 2006. And I started home brewing back in '97, uh, back in New Jersey, but just very little. I do maybe one batch every two months, and then usually, you know, about five gallons. Um, and then when I came out here, it was uh, a passion I really started to pick up. You know, I moved out here. I didn't know a whole lot of people. Uh, just the only people I really knew were people in the fire department that I work at um, at uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord. And one of my captains, who I was assigned to as my mentor when I first got here, was also a home brewer. And, him, and he's a craft beer connoisseur, and him and I just really, you know, kind of hit it off. And in the midst of him showing me around and really in-docking me on Northwest craft beer and how amazing it is out here and what a great industry it is in Washington State, um, I really got into it. And I just kept going and going and going. And then the next thing I know, I've got friends of mine that are like, oh, you know, uh, you want to come to my wedding and bring some of your homebrew with you? Mm-hmm. So it kind of went from there once, uh, you know, and then I started creating new recipes. And I have all of these guys in the fire department that were willing to, you know, take a 22-ounce bottle for free and drink it and tell me what they think. So I had this really great opportunity um, to develop my skills uh, rather quickly and then once I felt um, that I was ready to go on to an educational step, um, I then took the Siebel um, Associate's Degree program online. Um, while I was working at the fire department on our downtime, I was doing classes. Um, and then, you know, here I am now. So that's kind of how the whole thing started. Well, that's awesome. That's a, a great story there. Um, so uh, how, how big is the brewery? Um, I do a barrel batch at a time, so I'm relatively small. It's right in my garage, um, which is attached to my house, um, which I had to come up with some agreements with the city of Olympia on um, not doing growler fills or any kind of tasting tier, so we didn't have any traffic up and down the street. Um, but as long as I, you know, followed what they said I could, you know, the, what their expectations were of me, um, I got signed off and I was just going through the licensing process. But uh, so it is, you can do this from home, which is really cool. But uh, we're actually uh, talking about expanding already. Oh, really? Um, I got my license in August, and I've been selling since mid, mid-September. mid I think my first barrel rolled out, my first two half barrels rolled out the door. And I'm now at a point where I can't make beer quick enough, and I only have like four accounts um, that I steady keep beer steady at. Um, so... Uh, there's uh, a bar named Rhythm and Rye down in Olympia. Um, it's a great place. Uh, they, you know, they take my double IPA. Um, Three Magnets Brewing Company, their tasting room. They take. Uh, I have a, a milk stout, a coffee milk stout that I make uh, that I, with uh, coffee from a local coffee roaster. 
And then they also own a cafe in town called Vino's. Um, I have that beer there also. So, um, yeah. And then also I'm on occasionally up at Top Run Brewing Company in Lacey. So um, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, it definitely sounds it. Um, so uh, what size uh, system would you go up to from here? Um, I, we're looking to jump from a one barrel up to probably a 10. Okay, great. Um, and then we're looking at, you know, we're looking at a space outside of the house, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's where we're going to do the jump. I, I, I really don't, as quickly as I'm growing, I don't want to find myself investing in like a three barrel system mm-hmm. and then needing more and not having that paid off. Right. You know, so if I finance to grow into the three barrel system from a one barrel, which seems like a logical step. I'm finding that I might end up having to go bigger, but still having some financial commitments from the equipment that I want to upgrade. So I feel that if I go to a 10 barrel system, um, I kind of looked at a seven, but the pricing between a seven and a 10 is really not that much considering you're getting three more barrels um, out of your, out of your equipment. Um, I think that's something that would facilitate uh, my needs. Um, And uh, this is a family business. My wife helps me and my father-in-law, and we don't want to have to take on any kind of uh, employees or anything like that until I'm at least ready to retire from the fire department. Okay. So I want to, you know, it's something I can, you know, brew once a week. You know, I don't have a problem doing 10 hour days on my day off from the fire department and the brewery, but I don't want to get anything that's going to be too overwhelming. Yeah. So that's why I don't want to go any bigger than, than a 10 barrel. Okay. <clears throat> so. So, um, so how many, uh, since I, I know you're small, so you mentioned a couple different beers. Uh, do you have like a signature beer? Well, yeah, I, I the, the Dino's Coffee Milk Stout seems to be the signature. It wasn't really by my choice, um, which is fantastic. You know, I'm happy that I am starting to get a little bit of a following, and people are asking me on. I'm on Facebook, um, and they ask me on Facebook, like, oh, you know, when's Dino's coming out and stuff, and. I, I, I literally have to brew that like once every two weeks just to keep demand up. Um, but my double IPA, which is called uh, Citrosaurus, um, is uh, the one that is my favorite. I brewed that one for myself, and I've been brewing it for a really long time. It's got uh, – it's pretty much a citra bomb, um, but it's got a little bit of a heavier malt character. It's got a lot of East Coast IPA influence in it. So it's very well balanced. It's a little bit different than than uh, the uh, the IPAs and the double IPAs that are going on out here in Washington for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they're, they're, like I said, it's a little bit more malt forward, um, which I like. Um, I love hoppy beers, but I also like that malt balance too. Maybe even a little bit heavier on the malt than on the hops. So um, I've been brewing that one for forever. So that that one. Um, sells almost as well as the Dino's, but the, the milk stout, there really isn't a whole lot of milk stouts out here where, you know, Washington state, it's, you know, a dime a dozen for double IPA. So mm-hmm. yeah, well, definitely. That's, that's one way to uh, differentiate yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Now. So if you go to the, uh, the bigger system, um, do you plan on, on financing that then you were talking about that. So you would you looking at going to a bank for that. <laughs> Um, well, I have, um, I'm fortunate enough to have a federal retirement that I can take a loan out against. Okay. And it's really going to come down to, I can take out a substantial amount. So it'll really come down to, you know, how much I have available, um, how much I'm willing to take, you know, cause, uh, I'm either committed to, I pay that back through my, an allotment in my paycheck. So it means I'd have to stay with the fire department. And then if I were new to leave because this gets you know gets real big for me, um, it would consider income. So then I would have to pay taxes on it. You know, I'd get penalized just like anybody else. Right. But um, I do have that. I have that option, and we're kind of just sitting on that. And then I think what what we'll do is when it comes to financing it, um, I'm going to try to finance sixty percent myself, and then look for financing somewhere else for the other forty. Okay. So whether it be through selling investment units or talking to a, a bank or some other you know financial institution, I haven't quite gotten that far yet on exactly how we're going to map it out, but um, they're just some ideas that we're thinking about. Okay. Now you said that you've had uh, 
uh, you brewed a bunch of different recipes uh, over time. So uh, once you would get the bigger system, you know, how many different beers would you be looking to uh, to be brewing? Um, well, that's a good question. I like to do I like I like to do some of my beers on a seasonal rotation. So like uh, my Irish Red, uh, I'm you know, obviously next month. Uh, or the month after is St. Patrick's Day, so I'm looking to uh, start kicking out into gear here quick. Um, I've been experimenting with some bread and ice yeast, double IPA I got going on also. Um, so there are some other beers that I'll be doing, but I think for the most part I won't. Uh, I'll just have to kind of plan it out, map it out. I uh, Trying to just keep up with the demand for the stout and the double IPA. And then I I did a Saison, um I did a, a Saison. My parents sent out some bark from a plant back home called uh, Northern Spice Bush, which has got some lemon and pepper character to it. Mm. Um, I did that, uh, which turned out phenomenal. Um, but that's going to be for my sour beer uh, barrels. I got two sour beer barrels that I'm going to start a sour project, and I'll be bottling those. Okay. Um, I'm not going to keg those because I don't, I don't need the contamination in all my equipment. I'm way too small to buy double everything, you know? Right. So. Uh, we're going to be doing bottles of those. Um, we got a white and a red barrel, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, but as for like regular um, having beers on all the time and available uh, for sale, I, I haven't really figured that out yet, to be honest with you, because I'm just uh, um, what I do is I'll do the the two that I got going all the time, and then I throw a different one in after that. So that's pretty much where I'm at. And then I do a strawberry blonde that is extremely popular. I didn't get my license until after the strawberry was season was over last year, but that's the one that's probably going to be my big money maker of the summer. Okay. So I'm going to try to crank out as much of that as possible. So, okay. That's... That one will be, but, um, yeah, I got to wait until June for that. Sure. And then, uh, you know, so and I do a blueberry wheat also. And then, um, I know of a location of wild hops, on the firing ranges out at Joint Base Lewis McCord, and my son and I go out and pick the hops out there, and then we usually make a pale ale out of that. So that's another one that's kind of a seasonal. Oh, nice. So. Very cool. Um, so uh, I'm guessing right now that yeah, you don't have a specific goal because this is something small that's growing a lot faster than you anticipated. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. We, we knew that we were going to have to think about expansion and growth. I just, the way I had plotted it out, it wouldn't have come so quickly. Mm -hmm. But the other thing too is, is that I'm pacing, you know, I can set the pace because this isn't my full-time job, which is nice. Right. There's a lot of experimentation. I was keeping it very minimal when it comes to the business side of it, because if I find something that doesn't work or I make something that, you know, if I make a beer that's horrible, or I don't think it's worthy to hit the stores or hit the, the bars. I mean, I can just dump it, you know, and, 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 and I'm not losing a lot because I'm not, I haven't invested a lot. So, uh, but yeah, we're just trying to kind of find our way in how we're going to do this. So, and it's, uh, it's been a topic of discussion over the past couple of weeks. So it's something fairly new sure. for us. Well, that's great. Now, um, have you ever entered any of your beers in competitions? Um, yeah, I, I used to do the uh, beer for a cure down at Dick's Brewing Company. They have a, it's a fundraiser for cancer. Um, and my regular IPA got third out of 85. And my stout, not this stout, it was another stout that I had done. Uh, got second, I believe, and then all the, I, I, I entered like maybe five or six beers, and I hit top ten with all of them. That's awesome. Um, but I had a stout one year, and then, and then my regular IPA one year. Um, make the, uh, you know, we, I, you know, meddled with those two. So, mm -hmm. um, other than that, it seems like all of the local contests that I was um, exposed to, um, I just never had beer ready. Right. You know, I just never had, you know. Um, when I was, you know, when I was a home brewer now, I haven't entered anything and we're focusing on, um, the Oli Brew Festival to be the first festival that we do. Okay. Uh, we've been invited to a bunch of them already, but we're just like kind of holding off because we want to get, you know, get ready right. and have some really fun stuff to, uh, to showcase. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. The festival question was the next one and you just answered that one. Yeah. 
Um, All right, cool. Yeah. So, um, so you uh, you you've got kegs when you do this. Um, I mean, do you have plans? I mean, are you thinking down the road of of bottling other than like your sours? Would you look at bottling? Um, uh, possibly. Uh, you know, I've I, we've kind of entertained doing cans. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've thought about that stuff where you can have a canning company come in, you order the cans, get them printed, they bring in their machine, and you have to have like I think it's a minimum of three barrels prepared for them to to do a run. Uh, we've thought about that uh, a little bit, um, but not too much. I mean, to I, to buy a bottling machine with a ten barrel system, that's you know, bottling machine costs almost as much as a as a brewing system. They're rather expensive and a lot of moving parts that can break and you know maintenance and everything. I don't know if we'll be prepared for that. I mean, it it would be fantastic if at some point we could get to where we would bottle and can. Um, but I, I would think that probably we would enter uh, the uh, the field of, of packaging on that realm with, with probably cans. And I would like to do some tall boys or something, you know, like that. Mm-hmm. So, but All right. that that's awesome. Um, okay. Uh, I think that's the last question I had for you. Was there anything else you wanted to, uh, to let our listeners know? Well, I just, you know, would like to let everybody know that uh, the Olympia's, beer scene is it's hopping it's happening it's all coming together we've been working at this for a few years there's uh myself uh three magnets brewing company which i i had uh mentioned earlier um there's uh uh castellan brewing company which is over in lacy uh top rung which is over in lacy up by the uh, cabela's uh, off of uh the freeway um they're all making some really great beers um yeah, and also, uh, I don't know how many of your listeners are in the cider, but Whitewood Cider is another one. Those guys are awesome. We're all kind of a really tight-knit group. We want to support each other. You know, it's kind of, kind of why I'm name-dropping a little bit. Right. But, um, but yeah, okay. it's uh, the scene down here is just it's getting big, and it's it's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. I, we, were, we just all hang out together and do bottle shares once a month and just try to keep each other, you know, going and – and, uh, you know, it's cool. It's a good thing. You know, so we haven't really had anything. I mean, we have fish down here. Um, and then, you know, the other breweries closed. So that's basically all we had for a long time. And now we're starting to get some diversity. And there's a lot of different brewing influences down here. It's not just your typical cookie cutter, IPA, Hefeweizen, Amber, Pale Ale, Stout. It's uh, you got East Coast influence. You've got German influence. You've got... Um, you know, some very well educated people down here, so it's really cool. So I eat you know I uh you know, suggest that uh, you know, if you're listening to this, check us out on Facebook and come on down and have a beer. All right, so. awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we've been talking with uh, Rob Horn from Triceratops Brewing Company. And uh thanks for joining us today, Rob. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, we'd like to thank Rob for joining us today. Great interview with him, and we wish him a lot of luck. Now for a bar recommendation. I'm going to talk about Hopworks Urban Brewery, the bike bar in Portland, Oregon. We were down there a few months back, and uh, that is a great place. It uh, They had some great beer, and it's definitely kid-friendly. They had a nice section just for families, and they had like chalkboards and all kinds of stuff over there where kids could sit. Uh, we didn't even notice that at first, but... Uh, and we realized it uh, later on, and it was a, it's a nice area, definitely a good place to bring your kids. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Northwest Brew Talk. This show is produced and edited by me with engineering help from Michelle Rizzo. If you want to contact us, we are on Twitter and Facebook at NW Brew Talk, and you can email us at nwbrewtalk at gmail. Until next time, I'm Mike Rizzo. Stay happy, my friends. Mm-hmm.